Good afternoon, Facebook friends, and hello, Zoom friends. So glad you're here. We're going to have a Bible class, I believe. We're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 5 and just cover maybe one or two verses. Sorry about that, but we got some things to talk about today, so we're going to do it. Ephesians 5. You know, um, we've come down through this passage to see an instruction here by the Lord. At the end of verse 8, he says, Paul says to people of the Lord, walk as children of light. Now, in the context of the Bible, light must, it bears some explanation. It must be explained. It must be, we must be able to see what light means to the Bible, to the Word of God, to, to how things unfold in the Word of God. That's the important thing. So what I want to do is I want to read some more verses here, and I was just kidding about two verses. I want to read some more verses here, and then I want to talk to you about light in general and then light specific. Uh, notice it says in verse um, um, 7, Be not ye therefore partakers with them, and that was children who are the, called in the previous verse, they're called the children of disobedience. So whoever the children of disobedience are, and I'm not trying to identify them for you, you probably can come up with your own identification about it, but nevertheless, he says, be not you therefore partakers with them. If they are children of disobedience, then don't be in the disobedient factor of their lives. Doesn't mean you don't know people, love people, uh, have them close to you. It's not, you know, it's not like, uh, ostracizing yourself from everyone else that's not the point but he says be not ye be not ye therefore partakers with them in their disobedience rather he says in the very next verse for you were sometimes darkness but now are you light in the lord walk as children of light in other words to those who are of the disobedient factor in verse six you should turn the light on for them so that they can walk out of the darkness into the light. Now, watch how he unfolds that idea. He says, walk as children of light, right at the end of verse 8, verse 9 now. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. In other words, that is the context of walking as children of light. When you are, you are proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And you remember that word acceptable. Remember Romans 12, verse 2, proving what is that good and that perfect and acceptable will of God. It, so he says here in verse uh, 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Secret represents darkness in the context. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. So we got the light now. We've got a specific thing about, the, uh, about walking as children of light because now you've got the light to identify. So he says, um, uh, verse 13, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore, he saith, awake thou that sleepest. If you're asleep, are you in the dark or are you, are you uh, in the light? If you're asleep, you are in the dark. Now look, he says, wherefore, he saith, uh, awake thou that sleepest. Now the word thou there is individuals, singular. Also, it's to the same people, walk that, uh, uh, awake thou, Thou is the same people to whom he said, don't be partaker with the children of disobedience. It's the same people, he said, for us to, uh, for spoken to us in uh, early verses, walk in love as Christ also loved us. And, given the, and so there's a, there is a thing involved in, in having the light. If we are to have the light, then we are to walk a certain way. We're to walk as children of light. We're to walk in love. We, we are to be kind. When we're, uh, verse 32 of chapter 4. We're to be kind one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Otherwise, where's the light? We're hiding it. 
walking around in darkness, got a gloomy look, got the got the uh, foreboding look of uh, Joe, what's his name, with the dirty cloud over the top of his head. And I just uh, aged myself right there. That's in Little Abner cartoons, you know what I mean? So look now in, in verse um, uh, 14, where he said, he said, wherefore he said, awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee life. So how are you going to arise from the dead? Well, you are arising out from under, I mean, up, from out with, uh, you are coming out from the dead in order to be in the light. I really fouled up that explanation, I think. Here's the thing, folks. Wherefore he said, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead. You see, if you're in the, if you're asleep, you're dark in the dark, right? Yeah, that's what we talked about earlier. And there's no good works there. There's unfruitful works of darkness there, verse 11. So what you're doing is finding a way to awake out of your sleep and arise from amongst the dead. And then it says a great promise right here, and Christ shall give you light. If Christ is going to give the light, then I know where that light has to come from. I do. In fact, I've got an entire page right here in the front of my Bible dedicated to the beginning, the middle, the usage, and the finality of light. I do. I did this about uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 years ago. And I want to talk to you about light because it matches what we were just reading in Ephesians chapter 5. And before we get done, we'll get back to Ephesians 5. So we did cover more than a couple of verses. I'll just pull your leg there. Now, here's the thing. In Genesis chapter 1, God said, let there be light. Now, I, I know what that light is. It is in the sense of being able to make, to create everything that God created in the other five days. First, it took light. God said, let there be light, and there was light in Genesis chapter 1, verse 4. And in Genesis 1, verse, uh, I mean, 1, verse 3, and in verse 4, he said, God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. Now, if you're thinking, thinking of what God did there, think in terms of darkness was upon the face of the deep in verse 2, Genesis 1, verse 2. So there's, there's, the, there's this chaos there, and it's all dark. I'm not going to color all that in. I use too much of my ink. But God said, let there be light in that darkness. So the light in that darkness has the light has to come into that darkness. So all I'm going to do to represent that is I'm going to take out the darkness, this all squibbly line stuff, in the midst of that, where all of the darkness was, God said, let there be light, and he separated the light from the darkness. So I got that spot right there. He divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let, the, let it divide the waters from the waters. So now I'm going to go back to this chaos, and though there is light upon the chaos, let me do this again here, there's all kinds of light on the chaos, so we'll just put a brightness out here, and then there is a darkness somewhere, and I'll just do it like that. And, and this darkness is over here. This darkness is like, it's called the night. It's not called nighttime. It's called the night. And it's capitalized in my Bible. Hope it is yours. So there's this night. And then there's this day. Now, all the way through your Bible, there is reference to these things, night and day, and the light, and the darkness. Throughout your Bible, darkness is considered, is, is used an awful lot of times, a whole big number of times, it is used to represent ignorance or the lack of knowledge. 
Notice, if you will, in uh, the book of uh, Revelation, chapter 22, you may be able to find that. It's the whole length of the Bible from where I just read to you out of Genesis chapter 1. So go to Revelation 22 and notice this. Um, notice this um, message here. In Revelation 22, verse 16, John is hearing these words, verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto, unto you these things in the churches. Now, by the way, just so you get a good reference here about the book of Revelation, in Revelation, in the book of Revelation chapter 1, the angel of the Lord, the angel of Jesus, the angel of the Lord appeared and told John what to tell these seven churches. In between Revelation 1 and where you're reading this, it is the angel of the Lord delivering to John the revelation. Now notice verse 16 again. He says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. The bright and the morning star. What's that imply to you? Well, I would hope that it implies light. Look in uh, 2 Peter. Second Peter, I think I'm right about this. Well, maybe not. I don't know where that's at. Well, never mind. That doesn't need to be there anyway. I mean, I don't need to talk about it anyway, but it's called the day star there. It's not, not my point anyway. Notice, if you will, in... Um, um, John chapter 1, John 1, in John chapter 1, and by the way, just to shorten, I'm not trying to do a creation thing here anyway, I just wanted to show you something about the light there, but I'm going to take all this chaos out of there because what, what came out of all of this was order and the Lord did it and the Lord did it, it did it in such a manner that there is an earth and I don't care what you believe about the earth, you know, whatever but there is an earth and it has light from the Lord the earth has light from the Lord and there's an evening in the morning evening in the morning, evening in the morning for now some 6,000 plus years since God said, let there be light, and there was light. So I've got this earth, and we'll leave the earth right there because we'll come back to it. Now look in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, wa uh, the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, the Word, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Nothing wrong with that picture. It's got about what you've read in Ephesians chapter 5, right? Darkness, light, darkness, light. Uh, verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. It's a reference to John the Baptist. The same came for witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe through the light might believe. He, John, was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. It didn't say every saved man. It said every man. He was in the world, this light was, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, his own received him not. But, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that call on his name, 
which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Same kind of word as the word light. Light is like uh, light, but it's uh, the glory is like illumination. That's a, that was not a Greek lesson. That's just a poor lesson on somebody as weak as I am that could understand it. But that's what it's like. See, he said, he said, um, um, we beheld his glory and the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In other words, when John says we saw the light, it's more that John and the 12 apostles saw more of a light than Hank Williams did when he sat, wrote the song, I saw the light. But it's the same light. Same light. Now, what I'm getting at is you and I have got a call upon our life in, in Ephesians chapter 5 about the light. Okay? Friday, I went to a, a, a memorial service for a lady who passed away. She was 101. And uh, one of her sons spoke, and then a, a, a friend of mine from years past, whom I hadn't seen or heard from in uh, about 11 or 12 years, he spoke, and both of them preached the gospel of Christ. Well, they did a good job. They laid it out but just the way uh, she wanted it done and the way she had left instructions for it. And they did a good job talking about the worth of it and, and, uh, and inviting anyone there who had never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ to believe the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised for our justification. Anyone willing to believe on that for their salvation is going to get saved by the Lord. They're not going to get themselves saved. If they believe the gospel of Christ, the Lord will save them. Now, there's something more about the gospel that is, that is connected to this. Look, if you will, in Romans chapter 4. In Romans 4. Um, it would help if I'd get on the right page, wouldn't it? In Romans chapter 4, Paul writes that it, the word it rep representing righteousness, that which is always right, verse 24, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, righteousness shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Now, I should think in terms of that, that's the work of the gospel there. He was delivered for our offenses. He was raised again for our justification. Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised again the, uh, the third day. Now, my, the, what I want you to see about all that is how in the world could that gospel be represented, represented by the word light? After all, Paul told the Ephesians, Awake thou that sleepest, and Christ shall give you light. Well, he wasn't talking to lost people. He was talking to the people he's writing the book to who had believed the gospel. Remember Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. He's talking that book, to, that he's writing that book to save people. He says, awake thou that sleepest, and Christ shall give thee light. Well, see, then you've got to go back to your roots. Here's a guy, he gets saved, and he goes off somewhere, and he doesn't, he doesn't see any Bibles, and nobody teaches him anything, and he goes out in the world and does his own thing, and he's walking around in darkness, though there is light within him. So the Lord gives him an instruction, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Now look here in Romans chapter uh, 8. Romans chapter 8. And we'll start reading in verse um, 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. But you're not in the flesh, but in the... Did you realize that once you trusted Christ as your Savior, your flesh is not a factor? 
say, well, I'm still walking around in it. Yes, you are. Therefore, the Lord calls upon you on a continual basis. More times, Paul wrote more about getting rid and getting rid of the problem of your flesh and using your flesh to glorify the Lord. He talks more about that than he does about anything else. And there's lots of grace preachers that don't like to preach about what you should be doing after you're saved, and they're wrong about that. And if you want to call, have them call me up and talk to me about it, I'd be glad to talk to them about it. You know, they're all going to call this week, right? No, but listen, he says in, he says in verse 9, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's, not, he's none of his. So in other words, if you don't have the spirit of Christ, then you're not saved. But if you are saved, you do have the Spirit of Christ. Isn't that wonderful? That should be wonderful news to you if you didn't already know that. Listen, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to make light of this, but, but some of it is, it is so light but that it's almost funny. People don't know who they are and what they are in Christ. People don't know how to act. People don't know what to do with what, who they are and what they are in Christ. Isn't that something? Yes, it is. Notice now he says, uh, in verse uh, 10, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. That's one you're walking around in shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. As in Paul reminding the Ephesians, awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead. That's the dead right there in front of you in verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. You know what that means if, you're quick, if your mortal body is quickened? It means it's made alive. You say, well, I've never died. Well, that's true. But spiritually speaking, you could be dead. And in darkness like a sleep. But you can rise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. He that raised up uh, Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. How's he going to do that? His spirit. Your teacher is the Holy Spirit of God, third person of the Godhead. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, there is a spirit from God that has come to you to make it possible for you to receive everything that the Lord has for you. And the Holy Spirit can teach you what receiving those things from God will give you um, light for the world. Light for those who are in darkness, the children of disobedience. Walking on and on and on. All the people you come in contact with can receive light from you. Even save people who don't have the light you have. Now, uh, uh, just a, one or two more things right here in this passage, then we'll get on back to the light itself. Notice he says in verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, uh, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Glorified together with Christ. Now, we're in chapter 8, so the with Christ part is what you need to see. Go down to verse 29, uh, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. 
that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now watch this next verse. This is phenomenal. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, that you, are you saved? Then you're justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. If you are glorified, you're standing in light. You're glorified. You're made to be glorious to the Lord, with the Lord, of the Lord, for the Lord. Isn't that something? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was the light of the world. John chapter 1. Now, go over to 2 Corinthians. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, this is a phenomenal passage of Scripture. It's been one of my favorites for many, many years, and I love going here to this passage. And I love it for several reasons, and not the least of which is what we've just been talking about in other places. I know what I'm worth, and I know what I'm like, and I know how old I am, and I know how feeble I am, and I know, you know, all that stuff. I know the, I know the pitifulness of my flesh, shall we put it like that? But I also know how to be awake. And I learned that from putting my nose into this book and staying in it until I could see the light. Once I knew the things that I knew about, that I came to know about the spirit that I got, that I received from God could make me understand the spirit of God's leadership the spirit of God's timing, the spirit of God's, and, and, and it, boy, you talk about take a long time to learn it. I mean, I was a hard nose about this. It took me a long time to learn all this. And I don't know very much now. I just know who I am in Christ. Notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, in verse 3, he says, but if our gospel be hid, if something's hidden, what is it? Oh, it's not in sight. So there's no light shed on it. Keep reading. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds, blinded, blind, person who's blind, bless their hearts, cannot see, blinded. He says, in, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Look at the word light, glorious, and shine. Isn't the English language wonderful to the word of God? Oh, yes. Verse 5. For we preach not ourselves. Um, there's something in there I didn't finish, did I? Let me back up to verse 4. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Now watch this. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There's those words again. Shine, glory, light. Shine, glory, light. Shine, gloriousness, glory, and, and, and glory, and on and on. Those, uh, uh, um, once again, I think I stopped in the middle of the verse, so verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Here's a good thing to remember, verse 7. Always get this in your mind when you think about who you are and what you are to the world around you. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. It is so much more about light. Now go down in the passage. Go down to verse um, 
uh, 15, the last, I want you to start with me in the last phrase of verse 15, just so, because I don't want the context of verse 15 to interfere with your thinking. The thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. The glory of God is that same glory that you are part of the gloriousness of. The glory of God redound to the glory of God. Now notice verse uh, 16. For which cause we faint, uh, we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, that's not the brightness of light that's a weight a weight factor for our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory a weight of glory how could you have a weight of glory did you did you ever think about gl glory having a weight to it well let me tell you it does have a weight to it and the weight of the glory shows up up here In 10 precious stones. As a matter of fact, it's probably 10 stones and silver and gold. And you can find those lists in three places in your Bible. One of them is Revelation. I just forgot that where the third one is. <laughs> the second one, though, they were the covering that was on Lucifer. Think of it. He was the sum of all beauty before he fell. And he was covered with all those precious, precious stones. They show up in the book of Revelation and in the description of Lucifer. Now, here's my point. They're not on Lucifer anymore. And they're not on you. But they are going to show his glory almost in a victory march. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, what shall we appear in? His glory. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you also shall appear with him in glory. You're going to be in the Lord's glory. Do you understand the Lord's glory? You should understand the Lord's glory. You should say thank God for his glory because it's, a, it's but a light affliction called this flesh that keeps you from being there right now. Back to the passage. For our light affliction, verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Whoa. Glory has a weight to it. You know how you measure rock, uh, precious stones and gold and silver, don't you? You measure them by weight, not by size. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'll tell you what, let's do. We're, we're going to read 1 Corinthians 3, but go on back to Romans 14. 13, Romans 13. Ah, sorry. Romans 13. Go back there first. In Romans chapter 13, Paul makes a reference here to the, um, the uh, position that you and I are in right now versus the position we will one day be in. Look at verse uh, 11. And that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, just like he told the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 5, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And I know that's really knowledge, but I also know that it's light as the Bible uses light to describe this. So he says, um, verse 13, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof, and on and on. So he's setting the, Romans chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, all is setting up what he's talking about, walking as you should walk around the world that you're left living in. Notice in chapter 14, 
Verse 10, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Don't pay attention to these yin-yangs that tell you there is no judgment seat of Christ. They're not paying attention to scripture. They claim it's something really weird. Don't get me started on that. I'm not going to do that. He says, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, let's go over to the description of that. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 now. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Notice that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul refers to himself as a wise master builder, a very important thing to do. He's like the master builder in the sense that he took every, all the building blocks that the Lord Jesus Christ gave him, and he showed people what the body of Christ is supposed to look like. He designed it, if you will, by scripture. He designed it by the words that the Lord re revealed unto him. Paul said that he, what he preached, he got directly from, by revelation from Jesus Christ. And as he did that, and he wrote it out in Romans to Philemon, you see, in Romans through Philemon, the earth is not, the, the earth is not that which per, is perfected in it, but rather what is perfected in Romans to Philemon is the body of Christ. The body of Christ, the body of Christ began when Paul got saved, the body of Christ is all going to leave here at one time. And we're going to the judgment seat of Christ. Watch this. Verse um, 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and <clears throat> another buildeth thereon. There but let every man take heed how he buildeth uh, thereon. Verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. Who is this every man in the passage? Well, it's the husbandry of God in verse 9. We are laborers together with God, your God's husbandry. You're God's building. You're building. You're putting something into this building. You're laying upon the foundation. You're laying upon it the things that make it grow and become more, become as big as it's going to become, whatever that is. I don't know what it is. But he says, uh, every man, any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Mm -hmm. Notice the next verse. Every man's work shall be made manifest. And as in the term, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. All right, let's go to this fire. Let's go. You ready? Every man's work's going to be tried there, so here we go up there with our bundles of our works. And we've been building all this time. Colossians chapter 3 says, did you know you serve the Lord Christ? You've been building on this foundation all these years, all this time. And if you just got saved, boom, you're already, you're already building on it. Boom, you're going to do it again tomorrow. Boom, you're going to do it again the next day. Whatever, how long the Lord tarries, that's what we're going to do. We're going to build on the foundation. We're going to build with gold, silver, and precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. Every man's work shall be tried by that fire. How do you think wood, hay, and stubble is going to come through the fire? It's going to burn up. You know, the color of wood, hay, and stubble that is burned up is non-existent. It looks the way it looks because it doesn't have any color in it. It's called gray. Ashes, ashen. But the reason it looks that way is because there's not any color in it. What happened to it? Wood is pretty. What happened to it? Um, um, the um, uh, stubble of, of corn looks kind of beigey and has little uh, yellow streaks coming out the sides of it. And hay, oh, the new mown hay and all its splendor, the song says. 
smelling alfalfa cut in the field or clover cutting in the field. Just lovely, not after the fire. Pretty worthless after the fire. I've seen barns burn, taint funny. There's nothing but a pile of gray there where all the hay was. But wait, what about gold, silver, and precious stones? I put those things through the fire. They come out like a finer's tool would make them. They are refined and refined and refined, and they go through the fire, and they come out glorious. Gold, silver, and precious stones do that. Gold, silver, and the coverings, the gloriousness of your new life. At, after the fire. He says, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because he shall be re, it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Verse 14, if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. What would the gold, silver, and precious stones grant you with the Lord? Well, it's going to endure the fire, is it not? In an analogical sense. Verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. That would be loss of the glory of it, because there's no glory left in ashes. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. I have no idea how to describe for you what that means, but I can read those words. They're less than sixth grade words. It's easy to read. But look, the judgment seat of Christ is still being talked about yet another time. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And actually, we're going to back up to chapter 4 and finish that thing in chapter 4, the thought in, in chapter 4 because of that eternal weight of glory. Notice he says again in verse 17 of chapter 4, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more uh, exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And then the next four verses is going to describe our bodies that we get when the Lord brings us our bodies from heaven. Look at verse 5, chapter 5, verse 5. Now he that hath wrought us with the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident. Now, I'm telling you, we've read a whole lot of scripture here about works and light and awaking from the dead and Christ giving you light, we should be really full of understanding about the fact that this can happen because God is involved in this. God, it says right there, he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Verse uh, 6, therefore, we're always confident, knowing this, that whilst we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Another subject matter right there. Verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, I read the description of that in 1 Corinthians 3. I read almost the same words about it in Romans 14. And here it is again in 2 Corinthians 5 in, a, in an all, almost graduated sense of understanding it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We don't want anyone seeing the terror of the Lord. We don't even want our works to go through the fire. If our works are wood, hay, and stubble, we're not going to like that part. Here, as I can tell, the really good news is that, boosh, it's over. And what's left is glorious. Because when we appear with Christ, we appear in glory. His glory. He gets it all. He gets it all. Hmm. Yes. Isn't that marvelous? So he says here, um, 
in verse uh, uh, 10 again, we, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And it says, uh, we persuade men in verse 11. And it says in, um, um, I'll tell you what, let's do. Let's go back to Ephesians. Since we're really talking about Ephesians, let's go back to Ephesians and look at Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. And I'll tell you something else. I bet you that I'm talking to some people right now that wish I wasn't talking about this subject. <laughs> I stepped up here to see the time frame because I want I, I need to know what time it is. But I bet you I'm talking to some of you that don't want this subject to be talked about. You wish I was talking about something. Why don't you go back to talking about Peter versus Paul or something like that? I can do that. And I will. But we started out to go through the book of Ephesians because the book of Ephesians is the capstone. It is the capstone of church doctrine. And you should understand it. So, well, I don't know whether I ought to do that. Okay, don't worry about what you do. If you're saved, you're saved. But if you want to glorify the Lord, if you want to be something that he could say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. If you want to be something that receives the light of the God, glorious gospel of Christ and is used as a good channel for that light to come through. If you want to be that, let me tell you something. Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 is just as important as Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. Now notice how he winds up the chapter here of chapter 3, and it's about doctrine. He's, he's winding up the, the, the sort of like putting a putting a, a, a covering over the top of all the doctrine here. We'll, we'll pick up in verse uh, 14. He says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ now, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, not your flesh, in your inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Don't lose, don't lose track of things. To be filled with all the fullness of God is to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge and on and on and on. Now watch how he uses it. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Now see, here's the thing. What belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ has no end. So God be glorified for and by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Well, what does that mean then about light? Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Remember God said, let there be light. John chapter 1, John said, John the Baptist was not that light, but he bore witness to that light. Now watch this. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 14. To Timothy, he's saying, this is an admonition for Timothy's teaching prowess. He says, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times, plural, he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, watch now, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Imagine dwelling in a light. The implication is 
dwelling in a light that if you saw it, you'd be annihilated. You can't go there. He dwells in that light because he is that light and he's there in the sense that it's all he is. It is everything that he is. Christ is the light. Christ came down here, the book of Hebrews says, got a body, went back up there. Now, I know there's a lot more to that than what I just said, but he, he went into that glorious place and then he came back and when he came back to the earth, he went, he walked through walls, he went through walls, came into a room, he must have walked through a wall, he came into a room without opening a door, he left a room without going out a door, and on and on. He come forth out of that grave, and he's glorified. He's in a body, glorified. Notice Philippians chapter 3, and then I'll shut up. Philippians 3. See, I know that you know all this scripture. I'm just trying to tie it to the light of Ephesians chapter 5. That's my, my purpose. Look at this. Philippians chapter 3. He says in verse 20, for our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. And this, then it says, according to the working, whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. It took me a long time before I could understand why the Lord added that last part to that verse. You see, that glorious body is according to the working way whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. When God said, let there be light, and he set it all in motion all the way through from beginning to end, the end result is glory for himself. Jesus Christ is the light. I love the song that says, Oh, that will be glory for me. Glory for me. Glory for me. When by his grace I shall look upon his face, that will be glory. Glory for me. It will be. But the call upon our lives is about the light. And the light shines in the, our world. The light does not, um, shall I say, the light doesn't come on just for us to see it and then it goes off. The light is here in the world. We are it. We've got it. You know, we have a King James Bible, which is perfect in every way. And then we believe it, which it makes it even more perfected in us, and then we speak it, which makes it even more perfect in this world, that they should see the light. So in Ephesians chapter 5, verse uh, um, not 8, he says, walk as children of light, and verse uh, 10, he says, proving what's acceptable unto the Lord, got the light for that, and then he says, uh, verse 14, Awake thou that sleepest, and rise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light, and then he says, of all things, in verse 10, did I tell you to go back there? Ephesians 5, 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Circumspect is to see around you. Don't bump into stuff. You got the light. Walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And then he says another really interesting thing. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Did you know that you should be redeeming the time because the days are evil? That's what it says. Do you think of yourself as redeeming the time because the days are evil? How much of your week do you figure out is redeeming the time because the days are evil? Hmm. I'll leave that with you. I thank you all for being here. Let's have another Bible class next Sunday. What do you say? 4 p.m. next Sunday. We'll be here and do this again. Lord willing. Bye, everybody.